Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vince Horn, and I'm joined today over Skype. I'm sorry, no, this is Google Hangout. I'm joined today over Google Hangout with Lisa Ernst. Uh, Lisa, it's great to have you on the show, and um, great, to, great to be speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, and Lisa's joining us from um, Nashville, Tennessee. She's actually just uh, just down the road, I guess is what you'd call it when you live in the south. Uh, really, that means like six hours drive, but um, j just across the way uh, in Nashville. And um, over there in Nashville, Lisa, you're the um, guiding teacher of the One Dharma Center. Um, or yes, the One Dharma Nashville. One Dharma mm -hmm. Nashville. And um, yes. you're also, I saw an artist. Uh, you do a lot of like still photography work. I do. I do photography and caustic and painting, yes. Nice. And you were telling me uh, last time we spoke that you started out actually in the kind of tech, the tech field quite a while ago, but that's something that you've shifted out of since. Yes, I did. I started out in the computer business, and it was sort of my launching pad to do other things. So it, it worked out well for me. It was a good good place to get started. Nice. So, so at one point you <laughs> were like a full-on geek then. Uh, you, yeah, I was. I lived in a world of geeks for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were sort of in the world, but not of it. Then <laughs> I wasn't. I didn't have the uh, all the electronic, uh, the the engineers that were working on all the latest, you know, technology. I was more uh, in the management side of it, but it was all around me, and it was fun. It was really it was a fun thing to see the the kind of explosion of of the technology at that time. It was great. Yeah. About what time was that? That was the late 80s and early 90s. So it was kind of the PC explosion, networking, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then the early internet was was just starting to happen. Nice. Did you did you actually get to play on the early internet before it kind of uh, went went big? Um, most of the people within our company did, but um, I we did a little bit, but it was just at the point that I was leaving, so I didn't get a lot of hands on with it. But um, it was interesting to see how it was used back then. Yeah. Did you have any sense, having seen what you saw, that like what was coming was coming? No idea. Absolutely, total surprise the way it the way it evolved. It's been pretty amazing, for huh. sure. Interesting. And then that was really not that long ago, if you think about it, just over a couple of decades ago. And then here we are mm -hmm. having a live video discussion where people are tuning in. I mean, it's crazy. Just that that's happened in the last couple decades. I know. The speed of it, it just keeps going faster all the time. Yeah. yeah. So kind of, I mean, keeping that in mind, um, you know, a lot of what we're exploring on Buddhist Geeks are ways to look at how the Buddhist contemplative path um, is still relevant today, um, mm -hmm. can still support mm -hmm. us, even though we're living in this time of unprecedented change and uh, technological change, cultural change, um, global change, um, and yet there, there, if there is something of value, right, in these, these, these 2,500 year old tradition, um, it seems like something that we ought to continue to explore. So what I wanted to kind of yes. share, uh, explore with you today is um, in particular this theme of working with questions as part of the contemplative endeavor. And this is something that you focused a lot on. Um, and it's also something that you see you know, in different traditions, not, not just even mm -hmm. in the Buddhist tradition. Um, yes. So mm -hmm. I wondered if we could start first, uh, maybe with a little bit of your background, kind of how you got into practice, and then in particular how you started working with questions as part of your path. Okay, sure. Well, uh, I started out in the, the Zen tradition, and specifically the Rinzai Zen tradition, where uh, really one of the, the core practices is koan study, you know, which is working with questions that don't have logical answers as a way to get you out of your uh, traditional logical way of, of thinking and seeing things. And so, although I didn't practice koans exclusively or intensively, I did koan study a lot at retreats. And so um, I did become oriented to uh, looking at questions in a different way, even though they weren't so specific necessarily to my life. You know, these were uh, questions that have been used for centuries, you know, just specific koans. And so it helped me, I think, to learn to use um, use my practice in a way where I would bring those questions into a, I would call it a bigger space, where I wasn't trying to analyze, I wasn't trying to figure out 
and the teacher would let you know in no uncertain terms if you uh, were on the wrong path. And so you had to keep going back and keep going back into this this bigger space where you were you held the question in a certain way, but you weren't trying to figure it out, you know. And it, and and so that process, I think, inspired me in a way that even though um, after about ten years I moved away from the Zen tradition and moved you know, more kind of informally into the Vipassana tradition, I began to see that um, working with questions in that way is something I could do in my own life in a very meaningful way, and it has served me really well um, at times when uh, I would really hit a stuck point where I just couldn't find an answer and I couldn't figure it out, and I began to really open uh, these questions into the broader space of my, my practice and into the silence of the mind and the part of the mind that, that doesn't know and doesn't have answers. And I found that there's an intuitive a, a wisdom that is there that I could access that really allowed me to have a much deeper perspective on what it was that I was trying to solve or what part of my life didn't seem clear to me. And so it really became very helpful to me, you know, in, in working with questions in this way. And and I think part of what inspired me to begin teaching it was that I also discovered uh, Ajahn Amaro wrote a, a, almost a book-length article called Thinking, and in it he described this exact process. And so, even though he's a Theravada monk, doesn't come out of the Zen tradition. I saw the almost the exact same process as what I had experienced in the Zen tradition, and so I was really interested in the fact that it was so uh, it had so many parallels. It was so mm -hmm. applicable. Mm, okay, interesting. I want to go a little bit more into the actual, because I've done a lot of work with questions as well, and I find one of the mm -hmm. most interesting parts about it, what you were just talking about, this quality, I guess in Zen they often call it like don't know mind or not knowing. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit more about why not knowing is so important and, and how questions stimulate that? Yeah. Well, I think part of one of the... the the real powerful aspect of working with not knowing is that it can take us out of our habitual patterns, the part of our mind that needs to know, needs to solve, needs to fix. You know, and so when we can begin to open our mind to the not knowing, I think we, we begin to move into a, a lot more open space. And in that open space, there are so many more possibilities. And there's the space of the heart and mind and we can connect with wisdom. We can connect with something so much outside of what we already know. And I really think opening to that possibility and opening to that space can just give us something um, much more powerful and profound than if we're simply trying to stick with what we already know and project our ideas and our, you know, what we think we already know or how we think we should solve it. Begin to let go of that and move into a much, I think it's a much bigger and more open space. Mm. Okay, and then there's the, there's another side to this, though, right? Because, I mean, as soon as you start asking a question and, and assuming you don't know, then I've, I've noticed it can often be quite scary, and there can be a yes. lot of doubt then that also kind of accompanies yes. the not knowing. Like, oh, shit, if I don't know this, then what do I know? <laughs> um, so, like, talk, maybe maybe talk to me a little bit about, about the uh, the flip side of this, which is the kind of, you know the dissolving of knowing and and the and the way that that actually is can be quite destabilizing yes it can be scary it takes a lot of courage to do this because you're really in a sense you're letting go of the ground beneath you you know you're having to be willing to uh, you know some teachers would say, would say stand where there is no ground and are you can you do that and you know sometimes you just have to accommodate the fear you know the fear of not knowing and to be willing to be with that to be willing with to be with what isn't holding you up and to, to start to develop some trust in that space. And what I've learned over time is that I can trust it. You know, and initially it was it was kind of scary. And initially I had to sort of just be willing to have some faith, almost blind faith. But then over time I have found that it is a very um, comfortable place to be. It's odd that there's comfort in the discomfort. It's almost like getting comfortable with what's not comfortable and then seeing how it opens up from there and how it unfolds. And so um, for me that's kind of what's happened. So initially it can be really scary and then after a while um, that becomes a part of the process and it's it's okay. It's not so hard anymore. 
Yeah, it's making me think of uh, my early time in philosophy and, and reading Socrates and how he used questions to kind of pull people out of a sense of like having all the answers and having it figured out. I mean, so this is a goes way back even in the Western tradition. Oh, this, wow, this that's cool. Of questioning, yeah. Um, oh. Cool. So, so maybe we could talk a bit about um, you know you talked about how you worked with it in Rinzai Zen, and then also mm -hmm. you talked about reading about how Ajahn Amaro works with questions, you know, who's obviously a, mm -hmm. a Theravada monk. Um, how do you work with people who are interested in working with questions? Do you give them particular instruction? Do you just kind of like give them a question and then throw them off the throw them off into the deep end <laughs> without any instructions, kind of Zen style? Do you like how do you how do you suggest people work with questions? Is there any kind of like practice or technique to it, or is it simply just kind of grappling and wrestling with the questions themselves? Well, I try to guide them into it. It works best when I'm, you know, like leading a retreat or working with someone one on one where we can actually kind of move into that that open space of of meditation. It's a great place to begin where we're we first move into the silence of mind. And so, you know, if, if people have cultivated a little bit of practice stability, moving into the silence of mind, and then there's an intentional process of raising the question in your practice, just like, like with Zen. So there's an intentional element of then coming to that question. And then once it comes, to simply sit with it. And each time the mind tries to solve or resolve to keep letting it go. You know, and so you see it, and then to keep coming back to just the openness of the question itself. And to just, just sit with it and keep allowing deeper and deeper uh, associations and uh, thoughts. It's almost like we start accessing a lot, a creative part of our mind that starts to uh, show us uh, a lot of possibilities that we couldn't see before. So it's really a willingness, I think, to keep letting go. And if we keep noticing those times when the habitual mind tries to come in with an answer, we see it, we let it go until we finally settle. And I think there's a point where you start to feel more settled. And sometimes you have to work with your body and work with the, the, the emotions and the physical sensations that arise. Sometimes it can be a little scary to be in that place. And so we're really having to engage all of our experience in the practice, you know, and to be willing to to just keep settling into it and, and keep coming back, you know, and, and it, so it takes some skillfulness in letting go and, and allowing ourselves to just keep coming back to that open space where the, the question can just keep living and to, to really be willing to not have an answer mm -hmm. and to just live it, you know, that willingness to stay open to it and for the mind that wants to solve to keep being willing to see it and let it go. So it, it is a practice that you have to really be aware of, of how your mind is traveling, you know, and, and keep bringing yourself back just to the openness of the question itself. Okay, okay. So, so when you're working with the question then, there isn't a point at which you're looking for a particular kind of resolution to the question or an answer. It's actually kind of jumping back into the question over and over again, sounds yes. like. Yes, it's like letting go. You're, you're letting go again and again. And what people tell me when they go through this process is once they really get it, they often say they feel a sense of relief because there's been all this pressure to solve and resolve and to figure it out. And when they finally think, oh, I can just be with the question. I don't have to fix it. I don't have to solve it. It's almost like some form of resistance begins to fade away and we start to just there's an experience of dropping into whatever it is that we're trying to almost to, to get away from by solving it and by fixing it. And so that's where we kind of move into the experience of living it. And then out of that experience, you know, wisdom has a, an opportunity to arise that will start moving us in a wise direction. So it is that it's not that answers don't come, but they don't come out of something forced and something manufactured. Mm, okay, so because there's two questions that come up for me when I when I think about you know just working with a question perpetually. One is, uh, how do I come up with that question? Like, what? How do I yeah. find the question I want? <laughs> look, I'm working with, um, you know. And then the other is, how do I know when I'm done working with that question? <laughs> if, <laughs> Can I give you an example from my own life? With that? Yeah, sure, that? totally. Okay, totally. sure. Well, you know, for you, for some years, you know, I. I've, 
I was an artist. I still am an artist, but I was doing that as a profession. And I got to a place in my life where I found that I wasn't enjoying it anymore. It became like a job, you know, like getting up and going to the studio every day, and I was dreading it, and it was uncomfortable. And it, it just felt, it no longer felt like there was any juice there. But yet I kept going, and I kept pushing myself and saying, well, you know, somehow it's going to work out. But it wasn't working out. And so there was one point where it had become so uncomfortable that I started asking, is this my direction? Is this my direction uh, as a human being, as a, a career? I really started, it became a powerful question in my life. And I struggled to answer it, and I couldn't answer it. And so I began to just open it up, because it was almost unavoidable. It was like a question in my life that I couldn't turn away from anymore. But I didn't have an answer, and so I began to just open myself to the question itself. And as I did that, some things started to unfold for me that helped me to get further clarity. And one of the things that came to me was that I had been kind of procrastinating, maybe moving into teaching the Dharma for a while, and I realized that this was the opening. You know, that there was a point at which my art career wasn't engaging me, and it felt like the right time to go into teaching, but it was something really visceral. It was just something in my heart and in my being that was saying, this is the right time to do this. But it wasn't something that I was going to be able to figure out, you know, if I kept forcing myself to figure out how am I going to keep going as an artist, because this was something else. It had to come from a different place within me, you know, that place that was wise and the place that didn't have a, 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 a kind of a an answer that was just... Um, what I thought it would be or something that I was already expecting it to be, you know, about figuring out the art. And so as I moved into that, what I found was that um, as I moved into the teaching, it was the right time to do it. And I've also found that I can still, I'm still an artist in the sense that it's just something so deeply ingrained in me. But right now I'm doing it, I'm back to the creative uh, approach that I had when I first started, like the beginner's mind, I'm back to that, and I'm enjoying it again, and it's fun. Um, but in doing this process, I had to get out of all the habitual patterns and the expectations and the ideas about what I should be doing and really open myself to the question, and it sort of just unfolded for me. The answer came. Mm, okay, gotcha. So in some sense, you you know what the question is because you can't avoid it. It sounds like sometimes. I think yes. I think most of us have. That. Most of us usually have those themes in our lives, and sometimes by being still, we can come back to that. Um, and then I also say, if you're not, if you just sit with, you know, what is it, and see what arises. So sometimes we just have to be open to even that part of the not knowing. You know, is there something that maybe isn't so obvious, but that may reveal itself to us? Um, but usually there's something, most people usually have something that they're grappling with m most of the time, or that's what I've experienced with the students I've worked with. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting because I, I feel like what this practice highlights to me is that so much of the path is spent grappling and yeah. feeling a lot of uncertainty and yes. tension and lack yes. of lack of clarity. Uh, and that sort of runs in the face, I think, of a lot of maybe assumptions about what it should be like or what it, what people maybe imagine it's like, like that there's some sort of ultimate clarity that emerges and you just are kind of always clear about what to do. Um, you know, the, the ancient Zen masters who just <laughs> act spontaneously with, you know, no doubt right. or fear. Um, and yet that, that doesn't seem to, like, really... Um, it doesn't really seem to to be that way. Yes, I agree. And I think it's almost, what I've learned is over time with that, that it's almost like I've changed my relationship to it rather than to say that it's gone. Like the, sometimes there's anxiety, sometimes there's uncertainty, but I found that I suffer less when I make room for it. So I've changed my relationship to it in a way that makes it useful and helpful for me in my practice rather than a problem to, to get rid of or you know, something that shouldn't be there. So it's almost like the more I can expand and open to that, the more it actually is helpful to me on the path. Yeah, yeah. Now I want to bring in some someone that we both know because I, I know this is someone that, you, that you've that you worked with and, and I have as well. And I've learned a lot about questions from her. This is um, Trudy Goodman. 
uh, who's a fellow friend and teacher of both of ours. And I'm curious, yeah, like in your in your relationship with Trudy, what what kinds of things have come up with her in terms of learning about questions? Mm, that's a good. That's this a good is a question. This is a surprise. <laughs> this is a surprise question too. <laughs> well, you know, for years, um, you know, I would work with Trudy at retreats, and then um, during the times when we weren't, since she's, we're geographically separated, I would have you know just consultations with her over the phone, and quite often I would be coming to her with questions. I wanted a different approach to those questions. And Trudy was good about helping me get deeper into what, um, into this place, you know, this place of what is the real question, and then how do you work with it so that you can find your wisdom. So she she didn't uh, offer me specific answers so much as helped orient me toward, you know, finding that wisdom within myself, you know, and coming to a place where I could find that answer. So I think a good teacher a lot of times you know, isn't just sitting there giving advice so much as helping, helping somebody to to really open to their own wisdom and finding the doorway into it. And a lot of that means willingness to be in the unknown and to move out of the the traditional ways of looking at things and traditional ways of answering things. And so I think she helped me a lot with that. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I th I thought of Trudy because I I spent a month at Spirit Rock just asking questions on retreat with her. Oh. Wow. And um, I was really fortunate to, to, to be able to do that with her because um, I, I found out after I decided to do that practice that she had worked a lot with questions. And one of the things that I really stuck with me that she suggested was um, like a kind of practical thing. She said, you know, when you're working with a question, um, it's like if you're, you've lost your keys and you're looking for them. When you ask the question, it's like you, you, you maintain that kind of intense looking, that intense kind of... Uh, um, in, like you're looking for your keys, you continue to, to, to kind of maintain a focus on the question even mm -hmm. after you've asked it. Um, mm -hmm. and I thought that was kind of helpful. Yeah, like really holding it in a certain way, keeping it with you. Yeah, keeping it alive, like keeping the fire stoked behind the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, cool. Well, um, thank you so much for exploring that. I, I did want to ask too, maybe a final question. Um, before mm -hmm. we before we wrap up this conversation, um, given that you've explored you know both the Zen tradition and then the Vipassana tradition, I was curious if 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 you've seen any differences in terms of how some of these different approaches work with questions and um, what you make of those differences. Um, yeah, I have seen a different the difference in the the Zen tradition when I was working with the Koans. There was a kind of intensity around it, you know, and a kind of um, an, an intensity of working with it that kind of uh, threw you out of your 